today is found in Exodus 24. If you want to follow along, it's page 64 in your pew Bible. Exodus 24, verses 8 through 18. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement, made of lapis lazuli, as bright blue as the sky. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God. They ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. Then Moses set out with Joshua his aid, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you and anyone involved in the dispute can go to them. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain. And he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. The word of the Lord. Amen. Be to God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 2, verses 6 through 12. And since there are only seven verses, we'll all read them together. Page 431 and 432 of your Bibles. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Praise be to God. Our second reading is taken from 2 Peter chapter 1. It uh, can be found on page 984. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also had the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by a prophet's own interpretation of things. Her prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But through prophet, but prophets through low human spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, the word of the Lord.
Let's do it from Matthew in the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. I'll be reading Matthew 17, 1 through 9, page 798. It's the Transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up and they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace and peace from our, our Lord and Savior, our transfigured Lord and Savior. I kind of my message this morning, the cloud of God, because that has a that word has a, a very special meaning. As we look at our, our readings this morning, when Moses went up the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of God settled on the mountain. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, the seventh the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. And then again in our, our New Testament. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered him, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now as I was looking at this, it was interesting. And it's always interesting when you study the Bible. To see why words are used where they are. And something we always must remember is the Bible was not inspired in our language. It was not inspired in English. It was inspired in the true language of the time, which was Hebrew, Arabic, and Greek. It was those languages in that order that the Bible was given. Everything else is a translation from there. It was kind of an interesting research shows today that we wouldn't recognize the original text even if we spoke those three languages. For in our more modern world, the, the pronunciation of the formats have changed so much that even a, a skilled reader would have trouble. It's kind of like the King James Version of the NIV for us. It's all English, right? But it's totally different. But we're assured by Jesus in the New Testament that the message of the Bible has never and will never change. So just because there's a translation change here or there doesn't mean the message change. Because when you look at it, there's 4,228 years from Genesis to Revelation. Think of the different ways of saying things in that many years. And you consider Revelation happened in 90, 80, 95, or 96, so that's about 1920 some years from where we are now. So you look at how the language has changed in all those almost 2,000 years. It's hard to imagine how we keep track of it, how we keep faith true, how we keep that Bible in the real world. But we always have to remember the Holy Spirit is who's guiding. The Holy Spirit will show us what he wants us to know. So today we have the term cloud in our, in our readings. Now, the word cloud is seen often in the Bible. But what were they referring to? Was it the water vapor fluff that we know that clouds are? Was it those big 
billowing things that you don't fly through, as a pilot friend of mine told me. You never fly through that, you always go around. Well, actually, in, the, in Hebrew, where it came from, the word cloud means a covering. As in the clouds covered the sky, they, they blocked their view of heaven from the earth. We see clouds as something totally different. But then again, the word cloud is also considered divine presence in Hebrew. And see, that one came from experience itself. Exodus 13, 21. By the day the Lord went ahead of them, ahead of them in a pillar of a cloud to guide them on their way. And by night a pillar of fire to give them light. So they could travel by day or night. So when we see the word cloud in the Bible, they're not talking about what we have figured out they are. They were more of a mystery to them. And I guess that's kind of the neat part. Our Bible wants us to read and understand how they thought. As I said, they didn't know that cloud was made of water vapor. They didn't know the scientific terms of why it was there. All they knew that a cloud meant that God was near. That the presence of God was with them and there was a cloud. Now today we're looking at the, the, one of the latest times that God came in the presence of a cloud. When he covered Jesus and the disciples on, on Mount Tabor, now called the Mount of Transfiguration. Where Jesus' holiness was, was revealed to these men. Because you think about it, before this, Jesus was always just seen as human. John the Baptist saw more. He witnessed the Spirit coming out. But no one really, no one, according to our scripture, no one else really saw it that day. The disciples were with Jesus every day, but did they really understand him for who he was? I think that's why Jesus took those three up the mountain with him. He decided it was time for them to see more. As our gospel told us, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them, led them up the high mountain. There he is transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. As our New Testament tells us, they saw with their own eyes. This wasn't just something they made up. But think of this great sight to see. Of course, Peter wants to do something right away. You know, that's the Peter we know from the disciples. He's going to do something to make a shelter and get right after it. But before he can finish what he's saying, the cloud appears. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. I love them last three words. Listen to him. I mean, wow. From God himself. Listen to him. No. But then the next verse, next two verses, or three actually, I'm sorry. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came to them and get up, he said, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Talk about getting the, the jeepers scared out of them. I mean, that's why we can tell that the Bible is, the, the writing is absolutely true. They said that the disciples didn't know what to do. They fell face to the ground. They were scared to death. Now, if there were, somebody was trying to write this as a glorious big thing, they would have said, and the disciples raised their hand and said hallelujah and all this. But, no. They hit the ground. 
They were scared to death. As I said, if Jesus walked in that door right now, we can all say, oh, we, Jesus, it's you. We raise our arms and sing hallelujah. But actually, I'm afraid we'd all do the same thing. We'd probably hit the ground and go, oh, my God, it's, it's really him. But as I say, that's why we can tell our Bible's real. What happened is real. That's exactly what we'd have done if that would have happened to us. It's, it's who we are. Now, the things that, the thing that always gets me is when we go on to verse, verse 9. As we were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until a son of man has been raised from the dead. I imagine being one of those disciples. Here you just saw one of the greatest things that you've ever seen. Jesus says, don't tell anybody. It's like, come on, God. What? So why didn't Jesus want them to tell people what they saw? Well, it's simple. Jesus didn't want this moment to be the ultimate moment in, in his mission. When you think about it, they went down and told the people what they saw. First off, how many would believe it? Some, some maybe not. But the ones who did believe the disciples of what they saw, the first thing they did was they want to build a, a temple on Mount Tabor, wouldn't they? <coughs> they said, oh my God, that's where it happened. Let's build a temple up there and make a, a, a holy site out of this. But that's not what Jesus wanted. He showed those disciples what he did, as they say, so they could truly understand what was going on. And I guarantee you, they went back and told the disciples, the other disciples, what they saw. That's you. That's, that's what would happen. And I guarantee each one said, hey, you can't believe what I saw, but don't tell nobody else. And I think Jesus knew that too. But that way his group understood that there was more to Jesus than that meant to happen. <coughs> no. The lesson that Jesus was trying to teach him was that we not let moments <coughs> change our faith. So the disciples would never forget that moment. They would go down. But it was just one of the moments on Jesus' mission. I mean, you think of the miracles that he performed before this. You think of the miracles that the people saw. Did they really say, well, wow, Jesus is really the Son of God? <coughs> some did, some did. Jesus knew he had more coming than what happened there. And he didn't want them focusing on that anymore. But as I say, that's what people do. We get excited about the moment. We get excited about the moment for a short period, and then we look for the next big thing. Last week was what? Last Sunday. Uh, Super Bowl or something like that? The whole country. They wanted to take Monday off because Super Bowl Sunday. And the whole country was into this Super Bowl thing. And that's over. It's done. What are we looking for next? What's our next big moment? And that's where Jesus didn't want this moment changing things. Now, the disciples had to had just put that in their memory. Just had to put it in their minds and go, wow. And then Jesus said, I have more coming and more to do. And that's what faith is all about. But as I have to look for what Jesus is doing next. We don't, we don't stop and worship him on the spot. We thank him for what he did and we help him do the next thing. The transfiguration. 
as I say, we we'll, we we can't understand it. We can't imagine what it looked like, but we know the words are true because they're written in our Bibles. It helps us to believe, and that's what the Bible's all about: is to help us believe. Believe by what others have seen. Take that with you, but don't stay there. Take that with you on your journey to move forward. So God tells us every day. Remember, I'm with you. And as he said, this is my son, come well pleased. Listen to him. If you get nothing else out of that whole moment, remember those three <laughs> words. Listen to him. Because the rest is all, all yet to come. Uh, our world's in a, in a situation right now where we do exactly that simple thing. We look for the next big moment. The news focuses on what's going on at that moment. Then we look for the next one. But God says, trust me. Because I'm God. And I got your whole life plan. And what happened yesterday is not going to affect what I have for you tomorrow. Just keep trusting me. No. It's, faith is so simple. It's just a good thing. We just have to remember that. I'll tell you what, let us pray. Oh, dear Jesus, we put ourselves in those shoes, those sandals of the disciples. It would be easy to just stop and say, wow, we see it, seen Jesus right here, right in this spot. But you told them, no, don't tell anybody until I have been raised from the dead. I wonder if they really knew what you meant by that statement. We almost know they didn't know. They were too amazed by what had just happened to even hear what you just said. But Lord, we know, as I say every week, we know the whole story. That you didn't come back, that you didn't conquer, conquer death. That you gave us a, a whole new future. You showed our ancestors who you were. So they could tell us. Now I have to just believe and trust in you. Lord, are we partaking in your meal? That you gave us, that you gave to your ancestors, or our ancestors, I'm sorry. And you told them, do this in remembrance of me. That's what our faith is all about, is remembering who you are and what you do. Oh, Lord Jesus, continue to guide and keep us, continue to hear and answer our prayers. Lord, just please continue to be our Savior. We just ask all this in your, in your holy, holy name. Amen.